Well, let's get you more perspective now on the global population. I'm joined in studio by Nancy Pendarvis Harris. She's the vice president of the JSI Research and Training Institute. Thank you so much for joining us, Nancy. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Now, we know that this year's World Population Day, the focus is originally based on the work that was done back in 1989. Talk about some of the progress that's been made since then and, and the work that still needs to be done. Well, the, the watershed was the uh, ICPD conference in, um, where 176 countries with their country delegations and their private sector and their, so, uh, their NGOs committed to providing comprehensive reproductive health and gender equity as a way of, of achieving the sustainable development goals. This was huge. I was there. It was wonderful. And a lot of progress has been made. Birth rates are down in the, some of the poorest countries. Uh, severe poverty is down worldwide. But there's a lot that still needs to be done. And um, so we have, still have the poorest are really poor. And you have a lot of resistance in the countries with the highest growth rates, particularly um, in Africa and, and some Asian countries. And so for a lot of people who can't really understand the, the, the connection here, how should people understand reproductive health as it correlates with economic growth and development? Well, um, a woman who cannot con uh, has no means to control her fertility and has no, no services to have safe births and does not have gender equity, does not contribute to society. And so that accounts to um, uh, the figure I read in Africa, um, I think it was $28 trillion a year that's lost in the economy. There's an old saying that women hold up half the earth and they could be contributing to the economy in much greater uh, percentages if they, they were empowered and they weren't constantly bearing children many of which the many of which they don't want and you talked about this idea of, of some resistance in some of these high population areas i mean what sort of public or private investments are being made to really address these issues well um the donors are very keen and increasingly countries are buying in they're have you know they're not only talking the talk they're walking the walk putting money into the budgets um Private sector is beginning to recognize that a empowered and healthy workforce is good for them. It's good for business, and so um, people are people are investing it in it in education, in training, and in having contraceptive and reproductive health services. And would you say the level of investment matches the current needs? Uh, unfortunately, not. <laughs> Um, unfortunately not. We're kind of, um, the current use of contraception has sort of skimmed this, the surface. You've taken the easy, you know, the low hanging fruit. Now um, addressing difficult social norms, social problems, um, very isolated areas, um, takes a little bit more time, energy and money. And it really is a, a cultural shift. It's really not as easy as sort of throwing money at it when there's sort of these long-standing cultural norms. Um, let's look at India's population. It's doubled over the last 40 years. The population of sub-Saharan Africa is expected to double by 2050, which is going to far outpace some of these dropping fertility rates we're seeing in, in China and Japan. How does one prepare or even manage when you have this sort of population growth on the horizon? Well, you really can't. The, the answer is that, I mean, there are programs that will show you how many schools you need, how many clinics, how many. Um, and um, most of the countries are facing dire, um, dire consequences. Um, Nigeria used to be self-sufficient in agriculture, in palm oil, for heaven's sakes, and now they import most of their palm oil. So the answer are two, one, people are starting to have fewer children, and two, there's massive migration. Now, needless to say, as you touch on migration, the lot has changed since the first World Population Day. What would you say have been some of the, some of the sort of these unforeseen major developments that have really affected reproductive health? 
Well, climate change is big, you know, and uh, people are increasingly facing um, inability to um, to manage themselves because of climate change. They're losing habitat. They're losing agricultural land, and um, so I think that's a big one, and that's causing instability. And we have more refugees and internally displaced now than ever in the history of the world. So this is this kind of destabilization is not good for business. It's not good for countries growing, and it's not good for changing social norms in positive ways. Well, certainly a, lot, a very holistic approach needed for, from all angles. Thank you so much Thank you. for your insights there. Uh, Nancy Padavis-Harris, their Vice President of the JSI Research and Training Institute.